Guten Morgen, Fräuleins. I know I completely murdered that. And I'm sorry I don't know how to say guys. I just know how to say women. Oh well. Anyway, morning to y'all. We have the, uh, the, the Domangy Moose still over there. Um, I might sh shoot you a picture of it in one of the videos. I don't know. Depends on how long it stays there. Um, Monday, uh, Sunday, we noticed the little baby moose in the middle of town. It's uh, sitting down eating the uh, trees in front of one of the uh, tire shops. And then Monday, it went across the way and was eating the trees by a little shop called The Wardrobe. And then Tuesday, it came back to the tire, um, tire mechanic. And looks like Wednesday, it's still by that tire mechanic. So it must have found that it, it likes it right there. And it's kind of just sitting there eating the trees. And it, it's kind of mangy, unfortunately. It looks like it's uh, lost quite a bit of hair. Um, but yeah, anyway. We've got Jim Butcher's Turncoat, which is book 11 of the Dresden Files. This is chapter 16. So if you guys can like, share, and subscribe, I will go ahead and get started here. Remember also to grab your copy of the book. And we gotta figure out what's gonna happen because we know that Engine Joe listens to wind is set on unfortunately Morgan has to die. We also know that Dresden and Ebenezer do not want to necessarily kill a innocent man. So let's kind of figure out what what's going to happen here. I stared at Lafortier's corpse for a moment longer, shook my head, and then pulled one of those disposable cameras you can get from a vending machine out of my duster pocket. I walked around the room snapping pictures of the body, the blood splatters, and the broken bits of furniture. I ran through the entire roll of film making the most complete record of the scene that I could, and then pocketed the camera again and turned to leave Lafortier's chambers. Back in the ostentuary, I heard voices drifting up from below. I nodded pleasantly to Lucky, who gave me an inscrutable look and walked to the balcony railing. Listens to Wind and the Merlin were standing by the buffet table, speaking quietly. Peabody hovered in the background, carrying a different set of folders, ledgers, and pens. I paused for a moment to listen. It's a trick I picked up somewhere along the line. Not really magic, per se, as much as it is, it is turning my mental focus completely to my sense of hearing. To find out the truth, the Merlin was saying as he loaded up a plate with tiny sandwiches and wedges of cheese and fresh green grapes. Surely you have no objection to that. I think the truth is already well established, listens to wind replied quietly. We're just wasting time here. We should be focusing on controlling the fallout. The Merlin was a tall man, regal of bearing, with a long white beard and a long white hair to go with it. Every inch, the wizard's wizard. He wore a blue robe and a silver circlet around his brow, and his staff was an elegant length of pure white wood completely free of any marking. He paused in loading his plate and regarded Injun Joe with a level gaze. I'll take it under advisement. Injun Joe, listens to wind, sighed and held up his hands, palms forward, in a consultary gesture. We're ready to begin. Let me get some food in me and I'll be right in. Ahem, <clears throat> Peabody said defiantly. Actually, wizard listens to wind. If you could sign a few papers for me while the Merlin eats, it would be greatly appreciated. There are two files on your desk that need your approval, and I have three. He paused and began to jungle the load 
in his arms until he could peer into a folder. No, four. Four others here with me. Injun Joe sighed. Okay, he said. Come on. The two of them walked toward the stairs leading up to the balcony, turned the opposite way I had when they reached the top, and entered a chamber on the far side of the room. I waited until they were gone to descend the staircase to the ground level. The Merlin had seated himself in the nearest group of chairs and was eating his sandwiches. He froze for a second as he saw me, and then smoothly resumed his meal. Funny. I didn't like the Merlin much more than I would a case of flaming gonorrhea, but I had never seen him in this context before. I had always seen him at the end of a convened council, and as this remote and unapproachable figure of unyielding authority and power. I'd never even consider the notion that he might eat sandwiches. I was about to go on past him, but instead swerved and came to a stop standing over him. He continued eating, apparently unconcerned, until he'd finished the sandwich. T come to gloat, have you, Dresden? He asked. No, I said quietly. I'm here to help you. He dropped a bit of cheese he'd been about to bite into. It fell to the floor unnoticed, and his eyes narrowed, regarding me suspiciously. Excuse me? I bared my teeth in a cold little smile. I know. It's like having a cheese grater shoved against my gums, just saying it. He stared at me for a silent minute before taking in a slow breath, settling back into the chair and regarding me with steady blue eyes. Why should I believe you would do any such thing? Because your balls are an advice, and I'm the only one who can pull them out. I said. He arched an eyebrow, an elegant silver eyebrow. Okay, I said. That came out a little more homoerectic than I intended. Indeed, said the Merlin. But Morgan can't stay hidden forever, and you know it. They'll find him. His trial will last about two seconds. Then he falls down and breaks his crown, and your political career comes tumbling after. <clears throat> the Merlin seemed to consider that for a moment, and then he shrugged a shoulder. I think it's far more likely that you will work very, very hard to make sure he dies. I like to think I work smarter, not harder, I said. If I want him dead, all I need to do is stand around and applaud. It isn't as though I can make his case any worse. Oh, said the Merlin, I'm not so certain. You have vast talents in that particular venue. He's already being hunted. Half the council is howling for his blood. From what I hear, all the evidence is against him, and anything I find out about him is going to be tainted against him by an antagonistic past. I shrugged. At this point, I can't do any more damage. So what have you got to lose? A small smile touched the corners of his mouth. Let's assume for a moment that I agree. What do you want from me? A copy of his file, I said. Everything you found out about La Fortier's death and how Morgan pulled it off. All of it. And what do you intend to do with it? The Merlin asked. I thought I'd use the information to find out who killed La Fortier, I said. Just like that? I paused to think for a minute. Yeah, pretty much. The Merlin took another bite of cheese and chewed it deliberately. If my own investigation yields fruit, he said, I won't need your help. The hell you won't, I said. Everyone knows your interests are going to lie in protecting Morgan. Anything you turn up to clear him is going to be viewed with suspicion. Whereas your antagonism with Morgan is well known, the Merlin mused, anything you find in his favor will be viewed as the next best thing to divine testimony. He tilted his hair, head and stared at me. Why would you do such a thing? Maybe I don't think he did it. 
His eyebrows lifted in amusement that never quite became a smile. And the fact that the man who died was one of those whose hand was set against you when you were yourself held in suspicion has nothing to do with it? Right, I said, rolling my eyes. There you go. That's my self-centered, petty, vengeful motivation for wanting to help Morgan out, because it serves that dead bastard Lafortier, right? The Merlin considered me for another long moment and then shook his head. There is a condition. A condition? I said, before you will agree to let me help get your ass out of the fire? He gave me a bleak smile. My ass is reasonably comfortable where it is. This is hardly the first crisis, Warden. And yet you haven't told me to buzz off. He lifted a finger, a gesture reminiscent of a fencer's salute. Touché. I acknowledge that it is technically possible for you to prove useful. Oh, gosh. I'm glad I decided to be gracious and offer my aid. In fact, I'm feeling so gracious, I'm even willing to listen to your condition. He shook his head slowly. It simply isn't sufficient to prove that Morgan is innocent. The traitor within our ranks is real. He must be found. Someone must be held accountable for what happened to Lafortier, and not just for the sake of the council's membership. Our enemies must know that there are consequences to such actions. I nodded. So, not only prove Morgan innocent, but find the guy who did it too? Maybe I can set the whole thing to music and do a little dance while I'm at it? I feel obligated to point out that you approached me, Dresden. He gave his brittle smile again. The situation must be dealt with cleanly and decisively if we are to avoid chaos. He spread his hands. If you can't present that sort of resolution to the problem, then this conversation never happened. His eyes hardened. And I will expect your discretion. You'd hang your own man out to dry, even though you know he's innocent? His eyes glittered with a sudden cold fire and I had to work not to flinch. I will do whatever is necessary. Bear that in mind as you help me. A door opened upstairs, and in a few seconds Peabody began a precarious descent of the stairs, balancing his ledgers and folders as he did. Samuel, the Merlin said, his eyes never leaving me, be so good as to provide Warden Dresden with a complete copy of the file on Lafortier's murder. Peabody stopped before the Merlin, blinking. Uh, um, yes, of course, sir, right away. He glanced at me. If you would come this way, Warden? Dresden, the Merlin said in a pleasant tone. If this is some sort of ruse, you would be well advised to be sure I never learn of it. My patient with you wears thin. The Merlin was generally considered to be the most capable wizard on the planet. The simple words with their implied threat were almost chilling. Almost. I'm sure you'll last long enough for me to help you out of this mess, Merlin. I smiled at him and held up my hand, palm up, fingers spread, as if holding an orange in them. Balls, I said. Vice. Come on, Peabody. Peabody blinked at me as I swept past him on the way to the door, his mouth opening and closing silently several times. Then he made a vague, sputtering sounds and hurried to catch up with me. I glanced back at the Merlin as I reached the door. I could clearly see his cold, flat blue eyes burning with fury while he sat in apparent relaxation and calm. The fingers in his right hand twitched in a violent little spasm that did not seem to touch the rest of his body. For an instant, I had to wonder just how desperate he had to be to accept my help. I had to wonder how smart it was to goad him like that. And I had to wonder if that apparent calm and restrained exterior was simply a masterful control of his emotions, or if under the pressure, 
it had become some kind of quiet, deadly madness. Damn Morgan for showing up at my door. And damn me for being fool enough to open it for him. Yikes. So now Dresden has pictures of the scene that Lafortier died at. He's also going to pick up a copy of the file that shows all the evidence that they have against Morgan. And he's going to then, I guess, go back to Morgan and talk it out and go, hey, buddy, 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 buddy. She, yeah, right. Um, and try and figure out what actually happened to Lafortier. And not just by figuring out that, hey, you know, Morgan didn't kill him, but by figuring out, hey, um, that person over there, the one that's, um, <clears throat> that one right there, that's the one who killed Lafortier. See? That's why there's ignoring. No, Ben. See? No, Ben. So, we just have to kind of figure out, I guess. Also, what about the death curse? What about things like that? Are, are we not going to find out what happened? Hmm. Lots of questions. Go ahead and leave comments down below and let's see if we can't figure out who killed La Fortier. Why? I mean, I, I guess I can kind of see why to create civil war. Because by creating civil war, we're going to split the council and then the black council that supposedly does exist because that's what Morgan says is going to be able to come in and overtake them and be the saviors to come in and resurrect the white council in their image but is that really what they want hmm anyway leave your comments down below and you all have a wonderful wonderful and blessed day